All right, well, let's continue in our study of 1 John. We're in 1 John chapter 2 today. And uh, it's always good to use Dr. Uh, James Gray's Systemic Bible Studies as kind of an outline for us. And uh, we noted that we, uh, he tells us in chapter 1, verse number uh, 3, he says, uh, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, John is writing here because he wants us to have fellowship with one another as fellow Christians and with God, with God, through Jesus Christ. And when that happens, verse number four, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Put those words together that you may be joyful. Well, how do we have this joy? Well, it says in uh, verse number five, this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. We say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so this first part of the book is walking in the light. Walking in the light. And uh, we see here that how do we walk in the light? Well, number one, by perceiving and confessing sin in the faith of Jesus Christ. Knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, we can then, as 1 John 1, 9 says, confess our sin, admit our sins, where our lives don't line up with the Word of God, and then if we admit those to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we can have that wonderful fellowship, one with another, and with God, because that sin is taken care of. Okay, the second thing is about keeping God's commandments. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. We walk in the light by living in obedience to God's commandments. Number 3, uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Uh, one of the commandments that's emphasized in this book is loving the brethren. Brothers and sisters in Christ, loving the brethren. Uh, number 4. This keeping of God's commandments is incompatible with the love of the world. We talked about that. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so uh, who are you in love with? Are you in love with the world and its desires? The, uh, what are the three parts of the world that we went over? The lust of the eyes, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the flesh and the pride of life. That's right. And so we see that in the Garden of Eden. That's how Satan tempted Eve. And that's also how he tempted Jesus when he was in the desert. And that's the same game plan he uses with us. So, number five. Walking in the light is incompatible with fellowship of false teachers. So we cannot fellowship with false teachers and walk in the light. You cannot be a false teacher and walk in the light either. And so let's see if we can complete this section today. Uh, verse number 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Well, how do we know the truth? Who lives within us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's what we see in uh, verse number 10. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. <laughs> The word unction is the same word in the Greek as what? You remember? <laughs> anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. Who is the Holy One? Holy Jesus. Jesus is the Holy One. When Jesus went to the Father, He sent the Holy Spirit to live within us. And the Holy Spirit allows us to know all things. Everything we need for life and godliness we can know through the Holy Spirit who lives within us as he operates through the Word of God, the Bible. So it says here, I have it written unto you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now what does the word Christ mean? 
O Messiah is what it means in the Old Testament. That's the Hebrew word for it. Sent one. Well, sent one, that's, that's, that's good, but it means the anointed one. God's chosen. So you, you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. You're a liar. You are an antichrist. Uh, it talks about that earlier in this chapter, that there's the antichrist who's going to come at the end of time and is going to oppose uh, Christ and his kingdom. But even now there are many antichrists. And anyone who denies that Jesus is the anointed one of God is an antichrist. And it says here that denieth the Father and the Son. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Jesus has just finished telling the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Verse number 7. He says, if ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. We'll be satisfied if you show us the Father. And here's how Jesus responds. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What, what is Jesus saying here? You cannot separate God the Father from God the Son. You cannot separate. You, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And if you talk of the Father, you also talk of the Son. Now, they're separate. You know, we believe in the Trinity. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. But yet, you can't have one without the other. Let me make this practical. You cannot be a Jew who says that Jesus is not the anointed one, that he is not the Messiah, the Christ. And, and yet you say, I believe in the God of the Bible. Because you cannot have one without the other. And that's what Jesus said when he came to earth. He said, how come you reject me? He says, because you do not know the Father. And that made the Jewish people all mad. But it's the truth. You cannot have one without the other. There's no salvation apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you have people to say, well, Jewish people are saved. They're children of God. You ask, okay, are they completed Jews? Do they believe on the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, no, but they're saved under the Old Covenant. They're saved under the Old Testament. Hold on. If you do not recognize Jesus as Messiah, you're not right with God. Because you can't have one without the other. The Old Testament prophecies point so clearly to the Lord Jesus Christ that to deny Jesus is to deny Jehovah. Jehovah God. And that's what Jesus, that's what John is getting at here. Uh, if you deny the Father and the Son, verse 23, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Look at John 8, reading after the same author. John 8, um, 42 and 43. Jesus said unto them, okay, verse 41. Jesus says to the uh, Jewish skeptics, the Jewish religious leaders, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. 
Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. In other words, besides saying your father is the devil... Uh, he's saying here, the reason you do not accept me is because you do not accept my father. You do not recognize that I am my father's son and that what I say agrees with Jehovah, the one that you call God. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Same author as the epistles. Verses 23 and 24 says, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You know, there's an old song that says, you can't have one without the other. And that's the way it is. You cannot have God the Father without God the Son. You cannot have God the Son without God the Father. And so you take a Muslim. I'm at the prison, and one of the Muslim inmates says, We believe in Jesus just like you. I say, Well, he's not the same Jesus, because you do not believe he's the Son of God. And so you cannot have one without the other. Any thoughts about that? So a Jewish person, you know, if, if they do not receive the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, what awaits them in eternity? Hell. Hell. Because if they deny Christ, then they're actually denying the Father as well. Okay, verse number 24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. It says, that which ye have heard from the beginning. The phrase from the beginning means the original message. You know, the message that Jesus preached when he came here to earth. Uh, you could say the original message that the Old Testament preached as well. Uh, look at Jude, verse number 3. There's a few books to the right in your Bible. Jude, verse number 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I have the word once underlined in this verse, and I have it as a footnote here for Mr. Schofield. It says, once for all. Once for all. And that is from Genesis 3.15, which is that proto-evangelium, <laughs> which means the first clear mention of the gospel, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. There is... One teaching, and the canon is closed. We do not add to or take away from what is in this book. And that's what John is saying here. You know, you've got these Gnostics that are rising up, even in the churches, who say they have hidden knowledge. Ooh, we have hidden knowledge. You know, you've got uh, in the Mormon church, Joseph Smith. I discovered these golden tablets. And I discovered a means by which I could interpret the golden tablets. 
And then he writes the Book of Mormon. You know. No. Once for all. The faith has been delivered once for all. You know, it says here, Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. The doctrine isn't going to change. God is not going to give new revelation to anybody in this age. The Bible stands. The gospel stands. What Jesus taught. What the Old Testament prophets taught. What Moses taught. It still stands. Therefore, if that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Um, let's look at uh, Colossians, chapter number 1. Colossians, a few books to the left. Verses 23, Colossians chapter 1. Twenty three and twenty let's see. Twenty one through twenty three, okay. It says that you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he, Christ, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you homely and unholy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. What is he saying here? Here you were. You were enemies of God and God's people alienated from God. And yet Jesus came and by dying on the cross he has made us holy and he has made us without blame. He has made us to where God cannot uh, find any sin in us. He has declared us righteous. Uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ we're declared righteous. But the proof of whether or not we've been declared righteous is in what we see in verse 23. If we truly believe, if the Holy Spirit lives within us, it says, if, you know, verse number 20 says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, if, verse number 23, ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. What is it saying here? You have an unction from the Holy One. That's what John is saying here. You have an anointing from the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living within you who is revealing the truth to you. Verse number 19 of 1 John 2 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And so it's saying here, if you stay grounded in the truth that has been preached by the apostles and the prophets, then it says here, you will continue in the Son, and in the Father. You're going to continue. God the Father is not going to let you go. God the Spirit who lives within you is not going to let you go. And the Lord Jesus Christ is interceding at the right hand of the Father, praying for your faithfulness. And you can get a glimpse of that prayer if you read John chapter 17. All right, verse 25. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. <laughs> Speaking of John 17, look at John 17, verses 1 through 3. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, this is Jesus interceding for his church, for his people. Father, the hour is come. 
Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Life eternal, life everlasting. How do we receive it? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see here, this is the promise that he has promised us. Jesus has promised us eternal life. Verse 26 These things have I written unto you Concerning them that seduce you. Seduction. It simply means those who deceive you. There are those who are going to want to take you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you have the Holy Spirit living within you, if you're truly born again, they're not going to be able to do it. That's what John is saying here. Because verse 27, But the anointing, which ye have received of him, of Christ, the Holy One, abides in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, or teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Who is the anointing? Come on, if you don't know this by now, then you, you, you haven't been listening. Who is the anointing? Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. Oh, <laughs> have I been a failure? No. Who is the anointing? What? Christ. No, no. Who is the anointing? It says the anointing has been received of him. Jesus sent, she's saying it, the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is teaching us all things we need. And, <laughs> and so, we have the Holy Spirit teaching us all things that we need. We have the Holy Spirit who has sealed us. We have the Holy Spirit. And if we have the Holy Spirit living within us, then He is going to teach us and lead us in the right way. That's what it's saying here. I may ask that question again because that's an important thing. The unction is the Holy Spirit. The anointing is the Holy Spirit. That which the Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ has given us is the person of the Holy Spirit. And He teaches us what we need to know. And He tells us, uh-uh, that doesn't line up with the Scripture. That's a false teaching. It's a false teacher. Okay. So verse 28. This will be the last verse we get to today. We'll look at some verses in relation to it. And now, little children, abide in him. You heard of that anywhere else in the Bible? Particularly the Gospel of John? Well, we'll get to it in just a minute. Abide in him, that when he shall appear. Who is it talking about here? It's not a trick question. Jesus. Jesus. That's right. That's right. That when he shall appear, they were all looking for Jesus to come back we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 4. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. What does the word abide mean? Constantly be with. Ooh, constantly be with. That's good. It means to rest in or to remain in. And the picture here is the vine and the branches. Just like, uh, just like a, 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 uh, there's a vine, which is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. The branch is remaining in the vine. And if the branch remains in the vine, it receives the nutrients it needs to live and bear fruit. 
Verse number five. Got ahead of myself, okay? I do that sometimes. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. But if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. They say the proof is in the pudding. Well, the proof is in the fruit. If we're abiding in Christ, there is life and there is fruitfulness in our life. But if we're not abiding in Christ, then one day we're going to be cast into the fire as an unprofitable servant. Chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 of John. Chapter 8. Then Jesus said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in verse number 36, he gives a little commentary on what the truth is. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So we go back to our text, and uh, Dr. Gray here, he says the, the last point under this idea of walking in the light is walking in the light is incomparable, compatible with fellowship of, un, of false teachers. And we see here that we know that someone is a false teacher because who lives within us to tell us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He is the unction. He is the anointing. And we receive the Holy Spirit from who? The Holy One. Who is the Holy One? Jesus. That's right, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit gives us the discernment and the ability to remain in Christ and not be distracted by these false teachings. Okay, well next time, Dr. Gray says, we enter the second cycle of thought in the book of 1 John. And uh, we see here, just as a preview, the second cycle centers around the thought that God is righteous. Hence, fellowship with God depends on doing righteousness. Fellowship with God is to be maintained by doing righteousness. And we're going to learn more about that, Lord willing, next time.